Hello, everybody. This is Schmitty with Talking Schmidt. Today on the show, very honored to have the one and only Steve Caballero on the program. We're going to try to keep it NorCal centric today, and uh, hopefully he'll be back for a part two. So um, don't get flustered if we don't cover everything. This guy's had a long list of achievements. He's been in skateboarding for a long time and a major influence. So remember that. What up? This is Clyde Singleton from WCRP on skateboarding. I want to give a shout out to my man Schmitty at Talking Schmidt. Catch me on that joint coming soon, bitch. Yep. Head on down to your local shop. Ask Nerdwizard Skateboards. Or visit Nerdwizard.com. For all your pondering needs. Tickety tack. Hey, it's Corey at Blue Plate, 3218 Mission Street. Come see us. Meatloaf, fried chicken, deviled eggs, Dollar Olympia beers. We're here every day of the week. We got a garden, and we got smiles on our faces. Come let us make you happy. Hey, this is Steve Caballero, and you're listening to Talking Schmidt. Holy cannoli. It's cool, like tonight is the night. <laughs> yeah. Oh, big dog's in. Do we really want to be here? No, everything's changed. We on? Schmitty? Talking Schmidt. Talking Schmidt, dude. <laughs> you gonna come out different. <laughs> shit my pants, man. Your Rolodex is fucking deep. Holy shit. It's right. about the one. The one. The one. Who is this guy? He thinks he's tough shit. What's up? Come on, Schmitty. What the fuck? Tell the skateboard police to come get me. What is happening? I'm here for Greg Smith. Yeah! <laughs> okay, today we got a great show for you guys. Forget that light, pass the jogger, snap it back, and kick that bike. My next guest has way m- too much to cover, so I'm going to try and keep this one NorCal centric in hopes that we can do a part two later down the line. He had the first ever Trans World cover, and he's had more Thrasher covers than anybody else that's ever rode four wheels. Legendary guest number two from the Pal Bones Brigade. This is Stevie Cavallero. <laughs> What's up, Steve? Good morning, Greg. Stoked to have you here finally. Uh, and thanks for taking the time to do this. It'll be fun. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I appreciate Dude. it. Dude. And that Thrasher shirt, where'd you get it? Bootleg somewhere. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> every year I used to go to Japan uh, to the Moon Eyes um, Hot Rod Show, and I'd go shopping um, there in uh, Yokohama. Um, what's that famous shopping place in, uh, in, in Japan? I don't know. I've it's never a, been there. Oh, really? Oh, okay. So it's kind of a fashion. It's the fashion um, area. Uh-huh. Bathing Ape and Supreme and oh, okay, yeah. And then they have this one shot that I always walk by, and they always had Thrasher um, t-shirts. <clears throat> and I'm sure Thrasher sold the rights to them to make t- t-shirts. Uh. And I pay every time I'd go in there, I'd find a new one, and I'd pay fifty bucks for it. So I paid fifty bucks for this shirt. Oh, damn! Is that uh, you have a Spider-Man one too, right? Exactly. Yeah. But that's where that's where I found the Spider-Man Thrasher. I'm like, dude, there's no way like Thrasher would even have this in the US. So I'm getting it. <laughs> that's you know, right. that's so bad. I've, I've had, I think, two or three uh, different Thrasher T-shirts uh, from Japan that were licensed for I basically I think they were licensed for Japan only. Yeah, you never know. I, I don't because I, I know they had some stuff in France, too, that was really bizarre. And I think it was getting licensed and then. But it was kind of like they licensed it, but they never saw the final product. And I think they finally saw the final product. And they're like, no, 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 you can't. Well, this is crazy. So I just knew if I got this, um, this would be a very cool shirt to have back home. I like that one. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Peanuts. Might have to come out with that one again, like in in the States. Um, you're, You're living in SoCal now, but obviously your start and everything was San Jose and up here. So that was kind of like where I'd like to try to talk about most of the stuff. Um, what was your first board that you got? Um, well, I started skating around 1975, 76. And I believe one of the very, very first skateboards was one of those roller skate, red skateboards flat with the steel wheels. Oh, 
Yeah. That was one of the first ones. And then I, I, I think not too long after that, um, I was able to purchase one at a sporting goods store. Um, this one called the Cal 240, which was um, a plastic board and it had clay wheels on it. Um, no grip tape and it was completely flat. Um, and then my actual very first wood board, I would say, was I went once again, I went to the, um, the department store and I found one in a box and it had a guy skateboarding on it and I picked it up and I'm like, oh, Ty Page uh, free former and it was wood. It had grip tape on the top and it came actually with urethane wheels, which I had never ridden before. And the reason why I recognized that board was because I was, I would go to the uh, store and look at this magazine called skateboard world or uh, skateboarder magazine. And I would see these pros that were skateboarding down the street, or maybe they would be going, building up their own little ramps and even caught sometimes um, guys trying to skate in backyard pools. Um, so that's, that was the focus back um, in the uh, late seventies. Um, and, Talks of skateboard parks being built in SoCal. We'd see diagrams and everything, uh, but nothing up in Northern California. Mm. It was basically SoCal based. Um, so I'd always dreamed of like maybe one day go to, to Southern California and, and go to this, these skateboard parks that I, I would see in the magazines. And what, what drew you to it? Was it somebody at school that had a skateboard already or like there was like, how did you even just think like, I want to go get a skateboard? Well, you know, back in the uh, mid seventies, it was always basically playing outside. Either you were like going to the Creek to go like look for crawdads, climbing trees, um, you know, building go-karts, uh, riding bikes, um, roller skating. I remember I, I, I used to roller skate on those little, uh, Skates, they, were, they, were, they made skates for uh, boys and girls. The w- girls were white and, and the guys were black and they had steel wheels on it. And um, those, were the, those were also sold at um, department stores as well. Uh, mm. And then when you go into the rinks, I think they changed to clay wheels so you could ride around in the wood. Um, mm. But out in the street, you would use steel wheels. And then um, skateboards, you know skateboards were popping around as well um the bit you know the, like the board i told you with the flat you know the very the roller skate 10 board flat board with steel wheels um and then um eventually you know i got like i said i got one that had clay wheels but the ball bearings were not sealed so the way that um the ball bearings were held were held on with your nut so if your wheels were loose and you went around a turn they, the ball bearings would fall out. Oh. The wheel would be wobbling like that. So I remember I'd always have to like try to go look, uh, get on my hands and knees and look for all the, uh, the ball bearings and put them back in the wheel and then tighten the nut back up and try it again. <laughs> wow. Were you um, like early on, Did were you drawn to anyone? Was there anybody in the mags or anything yet that you were like, oh, that guy rips or like that? you know, like kind of like somebody you'd put on your wall type thing. Um, no, I wasn't the type of guy like, like, like to get a magazine, cut pictures out and, and place them like on my wall, like, like looking up to different like skaters. Um, I would just see what, what they were doing. Um, obviously, like I said, um, Ty Page was, was uh, someone that rec- I recognized the name and I saw pictures of in the magazine. I would see all the ads. Um, you know, there were people like, Frank Blood, George Orton, um, you know, the Dogtown guys, you know, Stacy, Tony Alba, uh, Jay Adams, uh, right. Shogo Kubo, um, just, you know, uh, shoot, Greg Ayers um, that wrote for Sims, um, Brad Bowman, you know, all, a, lot, a lot of those guys, Steve Olson from Santa Cruz, um, yeah, a lot of these guys I would see in the magazine, but a lot of it was based on like either slalom, downhill. Um, there wasn't really much um, bowl or ramp. There was no ramp contest because no one had, um, you know, 
ramps with flat bottom. If you saw a ramp in the magazine, it was basically they were trying to uh, emulate like a, a U. Yeah, they would call it a U ramp. <laughs> um, no flat bottom yet. Um, right. And and basically, you know, there were no really skateboard parks. You know, so um, it was just a, a, a you know pretty much downhill speed or slalom or freestyle freestyle. Mm-hmm. Um, that was pretty popular in the, you know, mid seventies, late, late seventies. So did you get to go to, um, Southern California to skate a skate park before any parks were open up North then? I did. And that's, that's what really, really drew my interest in skateboarding was I heard about this park. I saw these drawings in skateboard magazine about this place called the concrete wave. And this park was right in Southern California, um, in Orange County, right across the street from Disneyland. Oh, and I used, to take, I used to take this uh, trip with my dad to Disneyland every year. <clears throat> and I heard it was being built and it was going to open at a certain time. So I talked my dad into um, letting me bring my best friend to go visit this, this skateboard park um, that I heard about and read about in the magazine. And that's when I brought that Type Page Freeformer board with me. And because it had grip tape, it had urethane wheels, it, it, I, I knew it would work really good um, on the concrete there. And it was the first time I ever hit a snake run because before I had gone to this park, um, I used to build these little ramps in my front yard and in my backyard to try to emulate what I saw in the magazine. Obviously, I didn't know transition, so um, I was just trying to you know, just figure it out and use whatever I had in the backyard um, to build these uh, you know, really crappy ramps, you know? Um, so I'd never, I'd never, I would always do, I learned backside kick turns. So before I could go, before I went to the park, I already knew how to do a backside kick turn, but I never went front side. So uh-huh. when I found this thing called the snake run, which was shaped like a snake, it sent you backside, but then you had to hit a front side turn before you went backside again. And that gave me a little, that was difficult at first. Cause I, that was very foreign to me. Uh-huh. And, once I got that, I'm like, oh, this is the coolest thing. And then they had this pool in the back and I could do kick turns. And even my first day, I, I worked my way all the way up to the tile. And then I just had such a great time. I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is really, really fun. And, and people seemed like they were super impressed because I was really small back then at age 14, you uh-huh. know, like I was nine or 10. Um, and um, so I knew that um, I had caught onto something that um, I could progress and be good at. Was it frustrating to like go down there and have this thing that you didn't have access to in your own backyard? Like, like it seems like you would go down there and, you know, call it practice or whatever you want, but come back and then be like, fuck, I can't wait to get there instead of like, I want to skate right now and do it, like have access. Um, not really. Cause it would be the same thing as like going to Disneyland and, and going back home and going like, man, I wish we had a Disneyland. up. In- <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just a treat for me. Huh. Uh, I was just enjoying the moment. And then all of a sudden, uh, maybe around six months later to a year, I hear that, uh, there's a skateboard park being built in Campbell, which is 20 minutes from me in Northern California. And it was called Winchester skate park. Okay. So I even went there right before it even opened and just looked at, looked at the park being built behind the gate and just um, looking really looking forward for it to open. And when it did open, I ended up getting my membership because you, you had to get a membership card first and then you had to have full gear, which was helmet, elbow pads, knee pads and wrist guards to eat, to either skate there. And you would buy two hour sessions, um, an hour session or two hour sessions. And so the first time I went, I bought a two hour session, skated for two hours and then went home and then um, just waited the whole week, just dreamed about going there the next week. And so it became a weekly thing where I'd get my, my parents to drive me um, to the skate park every week, you know, mm-hmm. and eventually I got better and better. And then um, heard about another skateboard park being built called Campbell Skate Park, which was around like a mile away from, I don't know why they were so close, but there was Winchester on Winchester Boulevard and Campbell Skate Park near Campbell Avenue. And they were, uh, they were a mile away. You could skate from one park to the next. It was insane. And so when I went to that one, um, 
I like that one too. It's a little bit different, a little bit smaller. Um, it had a lot, it had three different pools. It had a, a, a half pipe that started out really mellow that got really, really steep. So that was a good uh, run to like work your way up. Um, but also the thing that attracted me to Campbell Skate Park, once I stopped skating Winchester, I, I migrated over to Campbell was because they offered this deal that was, you paid $30. Okay, so Winchester was about $1.75 a session. For two hours. Yeah. And then, so when I went to Campbell, they offered to get people to come to Campbell, they offered a, a 30-day pass for $30. So I I did the math. I'm like, oh my goodness, that's a dollar <laughs> all day. So I bought the pass and then I just would just go to um, Campbell Skate Park every day. Oh, oh yeah. okay. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and, and, and from, from, and then I left Winchester. I left, the, I left there and just only stayed at Campbell. And what was right about Campbell was they had a weekly skateboard contest. So it taught you how to compete to win things. So I would work and practice all the times because, so I could win into the competitions and then win things like you could win like sessions you can win free gear, um, uh, win stuff from the pro shop. So that really taught me how to like um, benefit from practicing and getting good that you would, there, was, there would be a prize at the end of the day, you right. know. And then the ultimate thing was to get on the Campbell Skateboard Park team, which in turn, once you got on that team, you got to skate Campbell for free. Uh, and you also got product too. Santa Cruz sponsored the the um, the team, which in turn I I got a, a free Steve Olson board. I got independent trucks. Um, I got OJ wheels. So then I got the good. Then I started getting the good stuff. You know, uh -huh. once I made the team, and once we made the team, I heard that there was other skateboard parks all around the Bay Area. They were having their own teams and competitions at their park. So our team would go to every single skate park when they had a competition and compete against them. And that was uh, like 77, 78. What was the average session like size wise and stuff was how many people approximately are we, is it like today where you kind of had to pick times to go because it was too blown out or was it always mellow or like, was it always blown out? Never blown out. Never. <laughs> Two or three people. <laughs> really? In the yeah. whole park? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Sometimes I'd go there and there'd be nobody there. Or sometimes I'd go there, it'd be raining, I'd be waiting in the pro shop. Um, obviously on Saturdays and Sundays, it would be a little more, more packed, you know. But what's rad about the skateboard park was there were so many different runs that there's a snake run, there's a, the reservoir, there's the mogul bowl, mm. the big pool, the little pool, the half pipe. So there are different areas that you can ride that, Hey, let's go session this. Okay, now let's go session this. So you had all these different elements in the skateboard park. It wasn't like there was like one bowl and then everybody showed up just to the one bowl. So that's why, maybe that's why it, it felt like it was more spread out. And parks were huge back then, you know? Mm -hmm. So. So you said backside, it was backside air your first air? Yes. Um, actually, I think Alley Oop was my first. first oh, really? Yeah, like, like, going down into the transition and bending down and grabbing my board and yanking, you know, like not even like, like we, grabbing at the bottom behind my foot and behind yank, your foot. Yeah. And try to do an air and pull. And I remember seeing like an alley-oop in the magazine. I'm like, Oh, I want to try to do an air like that. And yeah. So probably like a, a, a method backside air alley-oop was my first one in the bottom of the transition. And um, so what was your favorite park out of all the Bay Area parks? Was it Winchester or Campbell or was there Fremont or? Um, well, back then, when I, when I started skating parks and when par parks were popular in the late 70s, we had Winchester Skate Park, Campbell Skate Park in San Jose area. We had Milpitas. Oh, yeah, Milpitas. We had Spinning Wheels in Cupertino. Um, we also had... A uh, Berlin game skate park. Um, was Berlin game the worst? <laughs> I, only I, went there one I time. heard it was really bad. <laughs> I only went there one time. Okay. And, you know, 
I don't know. I mean, I, I, I was so excited to skate these skate parks. I didn't even know if they were good or bad. Uh-huh. You know? so, um, I didn't really look at skate parks like that. You know, yeah. we didn't have a, we didn't have perfectly built skate parks to compare it to, I, you know, I, so I, I never looked at a park going, Oh, this, this is the worst park ever. <laughs> you know? I just never had that attitude. You know, some people are just like, so yeah. picky and like, Oh yeah, this park's way better. Like, no, mm-hmm. I was just, I just didn't, I was enjoying the moment all the time. And just the opportunity to like go from skating, like these homemade ramps in my front yard to like now going to skate parks all over the Bay area, entering contests, tra- and having friends, new friends, having a group of guys that you skate with all the time. You now the team. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was, a, it was a great, uh, way of building relationships and friendships, which I still have friendships with some of these guys that I skated with in Campbell on the Campbell team. Right. Which is pretty amazing. Scott Foss is one of them. Oh, you know, he was yeah. one. Of them. Uh, I have a, um, uh, a friend named Steve Swain, um, Keith Meek. Um, obviously Keith Meek was from, you know, the Santa Cruz area. So he, he, I think he might've been on Winchester's team a long time ago. Like Winchester had their team too. But Winchester wasn't as family oriented as Campbell Skate Park. Like they didn't have like contests for amateur skateboarders and, and every week. Winchester had their Pro Bowl. So they were always focused on their pro contests, like the, the Hester One series, the Hester Two contest, the, uh, the Winchester Open. They had three major pro contests there, um, but they never relied on like focusing on amateur skateboarding, building like that community. So Mm -hmm. I went as far as like learning from my upbringing at Campbell and I brought um, an amateur series to, to Winchester and I did my own series uh, contest there for the kids. And so they could win prizes and and just feel, get that same feeling I got at Campbell skate park. I brought it to Winchester and did it myself. Oh, that's rad. Yeah. So it's funny. And so I always kind of had that mindset of like, and I, when I look back, I always look at things and I always want to try to recreate what I see. I, I always try to, I look at something, I'm like, that would be so cool to be able to do that or, or create that or, 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 <clears throat> or do something like that. So that's why I'm so indulged with so many different things is I never look at something that's foreign to me as a deterrent. It's more of a challenge. It's more of like, I know, I, I believe in myself. So I like, I know I could do that. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm going to my own, you know amateur series at, at Winchester skate park, you know? <laughs> uh, and so then right around then, I, I think 1979 is when you get on pal. Yeah. So th- that, that happened because, so we were like Campbell skate park. Our team was the number one team in Northern California. We competed, but we competed as far as like um, Sacramento, um, Fresno, um, you know, all around the Bay Area, Cupertino. Um, but our team was was the best. So we heard that there was this championships down south in Escondido, California, called the USASA National Competition. So our team went down, to, down there to compete um, against all these guys. <clears throat> and this was the first time I was really, really looking forward to seeing somebody that um, I idolized back then. And that was um, Eddie Alguera. Eddie Alguera. I heard that that was one of his local, local skate parks. And that's where he would be competing. Uh, the first time I ever seen Eric Grisham in person. Um, and the judges of that contest was Steve Cafe and Stacy Peralta pros that were, that were pros for GNS back in, in the, in the late seven, early seventies. Um, and so I'd heard of these guys. And so I, I, I knew that they were judging the competition. And so we entered the contest. Um, I ended up, uh, falling or something happened. I didn't make a good run and I ended up getting fifth place in the competition. And then my teammate Clay Townsend ended up getting first. And after the contest, um, Stacy Peralta walks up to both of us and says, Hey, I, I'm, I'm, I'm Stacy Peralta. Um, I really like your guys skateboarding. I'm building this team. I have a new company I'm starting. It's called Pal Peralta. I would love you to join our team. And me and Clay looked at each other. I'm like, whoa, that's, this is, 
interesting. Like <laughs> both Stacey, I go, well, I can't really tell, make a decision. I have to ask my parents, you know, it's like kind of one of the, I'm 14 years old. Like I got to ask my parents if yeah. it's okay. You know, I didn't know what it entailed. He's all, okay, well, you know, stew on it for a month. I'm coming up to Winchester for the Hester series. Um, I'll be skating in that. Um, when I come up, you can, you know, give me your answer. Oh. So I talked to my parents. They're like, yeah, that would be a neat opportunity for you. So when that month went up, um, I went to the competition, met Stacy there. He brought Ray Bones Rodriguez, Jay Smith, I think. And um, Steve Olson was with him because Steve Olson was riding for Bones Wheels, I think, at the time. Mm. And then, um, yeah, we gave him the answer. We said, yeah, we, we'd love to ride for the team. <clears throat> That next that next week, I got this package with a Ray Bones Rodriguez deck, Bones wheels, put it together, and brought it to Camel Skate Park and showed showed the, the park like, "Hey, I'm I'm on this team." And it wasn't even called the Bones Brigade yet; it was just I'm on Pau Peralta. Pau Peralta, yeah. right? Yeah. Wow. What uh, what sticks out to you about Ray Bones Rodriguez? I know when I first started skiing, that was like the iconic board. The skull and sword and um but i didn't know too much about him because he was kind of fading out as i started to get in but was he like super stylish or did he have a bunch of moves or like what was his deal i think what was what stood about stood out about ray bones was super smooth and his stance was really short like oh yeah his feet were close together um but when you watch him skate really fluid, really smooth. And, hmm. you know, all the pictures that came out in the magazine, he had really good style. Tuck, tucked his leg on, on front side airs. He, he learned inverts, um, doing tail taps um, on the coping. Um, super stylish, super smooth skater. And, yeah, and yes, of course, his, his graphic was one of the most unique graphics at the time because most <laughs> Skateboard companies only had their their logo of the company, mm. and that would brand that branded their boards, but they never like had put images, you know, on deck. So that's what stood out for Powell was they had graphics on the on their on their boards that were really unique and right. drawn by Court Johnson, amazing artist that was very good at making um, art that was like you know three dimensional, you know. Yeah, those are iconic. I mean, I always told the story like when me and my friends first got the real boards, like the pro boards, um, yeah. we went to go skate in San Mateo and we there was four of us and there we went in and we got four PAL boards, but nobody could get the same board. So somebody got a cab, somebody got a hawk. Mm. Somebody got a Lance and I got a McGill. It, was that the fighter plane one or was which board was it? Yeah. So what, it, or the rocket with the, it was like a, wasn't it a rocket going through like a moon or a, a big planet or something? McGill's first board was a fighter plane. No, then his second board um, was it, um, the skull with the snake. It must have been the fighter plane then. It was probably the fighter plane. Because it was definitely, I thought for in my mind it was a rocket, but it was definitely not like a skull. It was like something. Yeah, so mine was a dragon. Ray Bones was a skull and sword. Um, Alan Gelfin's was a tank. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and then Mike McGill's was the fighter plane. Okay, yeah, it was the fighter plane, yep. Yeah. Is that right around the time when you met Fausto? Oh, shoot. I don't even remember the first time I met Fausto. Must have been at one of the contests, right? Definitely. I mean, I saw him hanging out at like a lot of the Hester series. Mm -hmm. And um, I think he probably had, was at the Winchester Open in 1980. Okay. Yeah. And who were the NorCal Rippers like? The first pro I ever met, um, I want to say, was Peter Gifford. Peter Gifford. From how? And then one of the second ones was, well, I'm not sure if he was pro, really for Santa Cruz, but Jim Martino. Okay. And Steve Olson came to the skateboard park with John Hudson, the downhiller. Um, okay. John Hudson was our team captain for Campbell skate park before I got sponsored by pal. And then uh, um, I had met Steve Olson. And did you hear tales of Blackheart or see Blackheart at all around? 
Oh yeah. I well, there's the funny thing about Blackheart was I used to read Skateboarder magazine, see all these pictures of Rick Blackheart in the magazine, and then I'm like, oh shoot, he's from Northern California. Winchester Skate Park's open, so I was like, oh, I can't wait to to meet Rick Blackheart <laughs> when Winchester opens. But then when I get there, I heard that he was kicked out of the park even before it ever opened. He, that's so. That's true. Oh yeah. So he tried to run over uh, <laughs> Wolfman Dan in the parking lot. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, maybe he got pissed about something. Uh, you could probably ask Blackheart about it. But mm. Blackheart, I never skated um, Winchester with Blackheart because he was kicked out before it was ever open. Oh, man. He might have jumped the fence. Maybe that was it. Maybe he jumped the fence to try to skate, skate the park went before it was open, got, got caught, and then got kicked out for life, you know. Did you skate that pipe, uh, Bora Bora? <laughs> um, never skated that pipe. No. 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 Oh, wow. Damn. Yeah. Kind of bummer that I never went there, but. So who did you or shoot? Bombor, Bombora. Bombora, yeah. That's, Bombora that's, was in, yeah. Who did you shoot photos with first, KT or Mofo? The very first photographer was Ted, Ted Terrible, uh-huh. uh for Skateboarder Magazine. Um, but it probably would have been KT. KT? Yeah. KT would follow us around to like different backyard pools and street spots and um, yeah, it would have been KT. Yeah. Cause I, I, I remember when the magazine first came out, a lot of the pictures that were shot for the, the big thrasher, uh, magazines of the, the big, yeah, the large newspaper. format ones, large format, a lot of photos said KT on them. Yeah. And do you remember meeting Mofo early on? <laughs> oh yeah. I met <laughs> my, my very first, like, um, acknowledgement or seeing mofo skate is watching this guy in a trench coat <laughs> with this weird helmet with black sunglasses going in the mogul bowl doing burts um at camel skate park before thrasher was even around right this this weird like mysterious dude with this gray trench coat <laughs> pumping it pumping in the mogul bowl and when you first walked into Campbell, that mogul bowl was right there, real mellow um, uh -huh. run, you know, kind of like a, a reservoir with a couple humps in the middle. Did you meet him? Did you become friends with him before Thrasher started or after Thrasher started? Um, well, I met Mo, I became friends with him at the park, but then um, when Thrasher started, um, I started seeing him around with a camera and I already had known KT, you know. Kevin from Winchester Skate Park. Mm. And then, you know, I had already known Mofo uh, and Fausto as well. I got on tracker trucks right when I got on Powell, which was around 1979. Uh. Uh, and so I rode, you know, contest around and I'd see Fausto all the time. And so I made friends with Fausto, even though I was on tracker. Um, and I, because I was a NorCal guy, he was always there talking to me and, and, and befriending me and everything. And, um, but he never tried to steal me away from tracker, you know, um, it wasn't until probably around 1984, uh, Mofo comes up to me and says, Hey, um, Fausto really wants you to be on the team. And at that time, tracker was really focused on Tony Hawk and, um, Tony Magnuson and a lot of guys, I didn't have this relationship with Tracker Larry, but maybe because he was really shy or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just noticed that they really focused on those dudes. And then I noticed that Fausto was always there supporting me and by my, on my side. So when, when Mofo approached me and said, hey, Fausto wants you to ride for the team, um, I snapped on and got, got so on. So about 84. Was was there any vibes from like, I mean, NorCal, SoCal's always had kind of this little tension or rivalry or whatever you want to call it. I know Indy, Tracker, Transworld, Thrasher, like all these different things. What was your kind of outlook on that stuff? Were you privy to it or were, was, oh, was yeah. it? Yeah. There was definitely a NorCal, SoCal vibe, you know, NorCal versus SoCal, like who's better uh, you know, vibe. Um, so when I rode for a, a Southern California truck company tracker and all my friends were riding Indies, yeah. I, I got a lot of shit. Yeah. Okay. I, mean, I got vibed all the time. Uh, they're like, well, dude, why don't you ride for Indy? 
I'm yeah. like, because I ride for Tracker, they they want to sponsor me, you know. I'm at, and so Gavin and Corey from the skate park would mm-hmm. always, you know, give me crap about riding trackers all the time. Those guys have given you crap your whole life, probably. <laughs> well, Corey, Corey for one. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, he's always been he's always been a particular, passionate dude about what he likes and what he doesn't like. So he would definitely let you know. Yeah. <laughs> was your first time on an airplane uh, a skateboard trip? Yeah. So when I very first got sponsored by Pal and Stacey had said, hey, we're going to start bringing you down to Southern California to skate these skateboard parks. Um, I'm like, oh, my goodness, I'm finally going to go skate Marina Del Rey and I'm going to go skate Big O and yeah. I, I get to go skate, you know, Upland and Del Mar, you know, Lakewood Skate Park, all these, you know, Pomona, um, all these all these parks that were all down there. Um, I was really excited. Um, but I took the bus down there. Oh, damn. Yeah. So there was probably about three or four trips that I ended up taking the bus at 11 o'clock at night from San, from San Jose. My dad would drop me off. I would get to Santa Barbara around six, wait an hour. And then from Santa Barbara, I would take another bus to Santa Monica to meet up with Stacy and I would get there about eight, eight thirty. And so there was, you know, I was hoping someday I would get to get on a plane <laughs> and get there in an hour instead of overnight all by myself. You right. know? Yeah. So it, I was, it was pretty interesting, you know, that my parents would let me go down there at 14, 15 by myself and take a bus all the way down there. A yeah. bus seems way sketchier for a little kid. Like it's so long of a mission. I know, but I did it and it was a free trip. And huh. you know, that the fact that, that my, my, my parents had let, like they trusted Stacy enough to let me stay at his house, you know? Right. So I would stay there with, um, with Mike McGill. Um, Cause he was, he would be visiting out of Florida. Then there was Teddy Bennett mm. and a couple other guys. Um, you know, um, from, from, from LA area, SoCal. Um, so yeah, that was my first trips down there, uh, was on the, on taking a Greyhound bus. Damn. <laughs> Brutal. Putting it, putting it in. What, <laughs> what's one of the, um, all time trips with Mo that you took like memory wise, it was just hijinks or something cool or fun or some of the sticks. Out. I'm guessing like going to Europe or somewhere cool. Yeah. So, Mofo always had this persona. He'd always had the tough guy persona back in the day. And, and, you know, um, so you kind of had to watch yourself around him unless you know, he might vibe you out or, 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 or just give you this mean look. And he, like, he always put up this, like, like I said, like, he's like the cool dude, tough guy, but the trip that we took, um, to Europe, a thrasher tour, um, unannounced, with um, Pat Noho, Dave Duncan, Gator, Krishna Soy, um, Lance Mountain, Gons, and myself and Mofo, all on a trip taking your rail. Oh yeah, that's when I. That's when I um, spent a, you know a long time with Mofo and figured out this guy is like one of the nicest dudes. He he took us to all these. Not only did we just go skate these these ramps and stuff, but he took us to all the sites like the forum, um, um, all these like um, art art artsy areas, you know, these museums. And then mm-hmm. I really got to 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 know him as a person and know that this guy is just got is a very loving dude and and creative and and wanted to share this this experience with all of us and super cool. Um, and that was, you know. 1986 or 87 i think it was 87 yeah is that the one where i think either gator and christian or christian and gons maybe they disappeared and went to see prince in another country yeah so those guys went to go see prince yeah they did <laughs> and i actually w- and uh the funny thing about that is is i wasn't in a prince so those guys all took off but i knew my buddy back home was a huge Prince fan. And I remember um, a hotel I was staying at. Um, I was at one late night, I was looking across the street and I see this huge poster being put up and I go, Oh my goodness, that's a Prince poster. That's the, 
the show that those guys are going to. So as soon as they put it up, I ran out there and pulled it down when it was fresh and took it to my room and saved it and brought it back home to San Jose to one of my good friends. Oh, sick. Yeah. So my good friend still has that huge poster um, from that concert back in 1987. Yeah, you're, you're kind of a collector dude, right? You've always like, you've got a lot of archival stuff from, all like i know you got the coca-cola collection and when we were doing the china banks thing you had the original poster of your sequence because julian was talking about that and we were trying to find it and you're like oh i got and it was like in mint condition i'm like jesus like has that just always been who you are since you were a kid i think the coca-cola collection was the very first collection i decided to try to create and once again i go to the store where these, there's these posters. Remember those stores? I forgot what they were called, but you'd go to these stores and they'd have movie posters or what? Yeah, and you band could, posters. And you just go through them, yeah. right? And you could pick out a poster and put it in your room. Maybe there'd be like Farrah Fawcett and then, then maybe there'd be a Jaws poster. Well, there was this Coca-Cola poster with a collection. I'm like, that is so cool. I'm going to do that for real. So... Because I traveled so much, I'm like, I'm just going to collect Coca-Cola things from all over, you know? Uh-huh. So that's what I did. I made a little shrine with different Coca-Colas and different things that I would find um, on trips. And that was my goal. Like, I'd go to a restaurant and it'd be a kind of cool Coca-Cola bottle. And I'd, after I finished, grab it and then take it. Um, glasses, uh, pictures. I mean, you name it. Anything that had Coca-Cola on it, um, I would collect it. So that was the beginning of, like, trying to collect something. And then me and um, um, Lance were into records, you know, into different bands. So on those same trips that we would go all over the place, we'd go record shopping. And so especially in Europe, um, I ended up getting some really great uh, Metallica bootleg records. So I have a a really nice Metallica collection, record collection. Rad. Yeah. And then obviously the punk records back in the day. And I also liked uh, Love and Rockets, The Cult, uh, was another band. Um, mm. So I'd collect a lot of their records as well. And then it went into toys. Um, once, um, like, in the early 90s, when kind of, like, skateboarding was kind of, like, slowing down, and it was kind of mostly, like, getting into kind of, like, street skating, and I was traveling, um, I got into collecting toys. Um, I, I would go to Japan. I'd collect uh, Ultraman toys. Um, I also collected Planet of the Apes toys and then Evil Knievel toys. You got a good Evil Knievel collection, huh? Yeah, because he was like an inspiration to me when I first started um, just being a kid, you know, challenge yourself, like building ramps, you know, to try to jump over garbage cans, uh, try to emulate him, um, like jumping over, like we jump over garbage cans and we would pretend they were cars, you know? Yeah. We built bikes that try to look like they were like motor motorcycles. You know, mm. we hard to spoke to make it sound like a motorcycle. There was different um, things that you put on your your bike to, you know, like a, a plastic gas tank. And um, so, yeah, he was he was someone like we would try to emulate, you know, and wide wide world of sports. Uh, jump yeah. in the Grand Canyon, like you're just like, what is going on? <laughs> yeah, he pushed the limits. To yeah. What- do on on a motorcycle which was very inspiring to to what you see today mm. you know he, sure. he paved the way to um thinking outside the box and and just thinking like hey you know i'm gonna take my motorcycle and jump over that car or jump over two cars and then you know as progression is you always want to outdo yourself and and so people would want to see him jump more and farther and farther and you know i think part of the excitement was you know he might crash or he might make it. Who knows? You know, so th- I think that was the thing that was intriguing for people. And that's why he got so popular. And he was really great at marketing. Mm. You know, he's a very good marketing guy. And his name was all over the place on everything. And that's why I have a, a great collection of evil Knievel stuff, because he just put his name on everything. You know, so there's a lot of things you could find. Uh, OK. But, yeah. So I know that you're tight with uh christian you guys were always like good friends and stuff but you rode on the same team with tony hawk 
And when there's the Del Mar contest and it's Hawk versus Hasoy and there's kind of like style versus trick and all that, like, does that put you in a weird position? Cause you're friends with both guys. Like what was your perspective on all that? Um, not really because I'm competing against these same dudes. So I want to try to beat both of them. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not the fan looking in and it, those guys didn't even have a rival, rivalry against each other. It was the fans that oh. created that. Okay. It's not like Tony didn't like Christian or Christian didn't like Tony. Right. Their fans didn't like each other mm. or didn't like the skater, like the skater that they went into. So, you know, we're all buddies, all friends, you know, it's just something the fans created. We were all competitive in, in a way where, you know, we're trying to outdo each other at that contest at Del Mar. Those guys were way above my skill level because they both had McTwists and I had never done, I had never done one at that time. Mm. So once the McTwist came out in 84, that changed the whole game. And if you did have a McTwist in your run, you weren't up at that top three. And because I didn't, I was always starting to place like fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. I could never get to their level and their, that ability in, in competition. So um, it wasn't until 1988 when I did learn a 540. Um, it was 1988, no, 1989, me and uh, McGill did a tour in Australia and New Zealand. And I ended up uh, landing my first 540 in, in New Zealand in 89. How'd you grab? It was a backside uh, method. Backside. Okay. Backside method. And when I came back home and, 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 and perfected it at the, at the winch, uh, at the, uh, the San Jose warehouse downtown, um, I remember Bod Boyle and, and watching me skate and I could do five forties. He's like, he's like, you're going to win a contest again. And sure enough, you know, I won a um, contest in Europe and also won that vision contest that they had in the warehouse and the one with their spine <laughs> no vision so this we were supposed to have this contest in mexico and it, because it got canceled uh they still wanted to have the contest so they moved it to the vision warehouse that was the elbow the one that was later tra uh, transferred to encinitas why mm -hmm. yeah that con that ramp was inside their warehouse oh, okay and i ended up getting first and omar got second and tony hawk got third and that was the, the first time I had beat Tony in a competition. The last contest I won against it was probably like 1982, 83. And then once, like I said, once the 540 came out, I, I could never get top three. Nobody could win a contest that didn't have a 540 at that time, right? Pretty much because that was the staple uh, of competition. And that was, the, that was the skill level at that time. And, and, so that, that trick always freaked me out, man, because I, I think for one, I didn't have the proper place to learn it. You know, when, I, when that came out, I was still riding my ramp in my backyard and it was 12 feet wide, 11, oh. 11 feet high. And it was not room to like really um, travel. Um, so it was like kind of a straight up and down thing. And then I remember trying a couple of them in, in Search for Animal Chin at Chris Boris. If you, if you see that session at Chris Boris, in Bakersfield, I spin two, but I never really committed, you mm. know, and that was 86, you know, and then, so I just kind of just left it, I left it alone. I'm like, you know what, I'll just try other tricks. Um, I could do units, which was a front side 540, but you, you put your hand down. So it wasn't really an aerial 540. Uh, it was kind of like a 540 hand plant. Uh. That helped me get up there a little bit, but not as much as if I would have just blasted a front side, you know, rodeo. That would have been cool because no one had done, had been doing those except for Hawk later on learned it without putting his hand down. But he was oh. one of the first guys to do a front side rodeo in at Del Mar. That's so gnarly. Yeah. Talk about like selling, like what were you selling? Like 20,000 boards a month or something for a certain period? Like what was the highest peak of like board sales in the eighties? Okay, when I got my first board, pro board in 1980 from Pal Peralta, I remember pocketing probably around $300 to $500 um, a month uh, when it first came out. And that was a, getting a dollar a board. 
And I was, so I was getting these checks um, for $300, $500 starting in 1980, 81. And from all the videos that were put out um, since then to um, Animal Chin in 86, I worked my way all the way up to getting probably around ten to fifteen thousand dollars a month um, in 1987, which led to about two hundred fifty grand that year. Um, getting one dollar a board, and that's when living a dream began, right there. And I, I think about it, I'm like, man, if I got two two dollars a board, <laughs> I would have made five hundred grand that year. Fuck, and that's that like, crazy, like. If George would have just said, been like, yeah, we're, we're going to give you $2 a board, not one. They yeah. had twice as much money out there, like, whoa. You know, so I, you know, we all made Power Peralta pretty rich. Tommy and Jim Thebo back then, rock stars. Yeah, it, but it was, you know, it was, it is what it is. And, you know, I've, I've had a, a very good life from it, you know, as well. And yeah, it's all, it's a business. It's all business. <laughs> what, what was traveling and demos and stuff like for you? Like, I mean, are you guys like rock stars? Did the trash more scene and future primitive make you a sex symbol? Like it's like you, you had the frosted tips, like <laughs> you, like you, Christian, some of these guys is just like, it seemed like probably wherever you go, it's just like the Beatles are here for skateboarding. Back in the eighties was definitely a fashion statement. You know, yeah. uh, we always tried to like, look different, be different. Even our board shapes were different. We always tried to separate ourselves and become, you know, individual, you know, this is before the whole popsicle. Mm -hmm. uh, we had shapes. So everyone's shape. Like if you saw someone's shape, you're like, Oh, that's cabs deck or that's Josue's deck or, you know, that's McGill's deck or that's Lance's deck. That's Roscoff's deck. You know, mm -hmm. you could just tell by the shapes, um, to the, to the way that we dressed, um, you know, and the funny thing is, like, I was always pretty shy growing up. So e either talking to girls or, or just, like, letting a girl know you liked her was, was very difficult for me, you know. Mm. And, and I remember, like, and during, like, high school or middle school, like, girls would say I was cute, but they would never want to, like, date me or, or go out with me because, I, I don't know, I just was cute, you know, mm. dude. Um, but so I was really always really shy um, I wasn't the kind of guy like, oh, I'm going to go try to pick up on a girl or go ask a girl out on a date. I mean, I didn't, I didn't even know how the prom worked. I never went to the prom. I didn't know you, you had to ask a girl to go to the prom. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, so I didn't even know how that worked, you know. Um, you need to get lessons from Christian. It seemed like he had it <laughs> dialed. <laughs> I know, right? But as soon as I got sponsored, started touring, started becoming pro, um, girls just started coming around very easily. You know, and you didn't really have to try. They they just they just let it know that they liked you. <laughs> right. So I, I I I gravitated to that. I'm like, oh, okay, you gotta do something that's attractive for them to be attracted to you, you know. Were you partying in the eighties or did you never really get into partying? Not I mean not really. I mean I did, but not not to the extent where it became part of my life where I had to do it every day, you know. Uh -huh. it, Maybe there was some sometimes, but like I remember the first times, like even like trying uh, a beer was like near Animal Chin, you know, drinking a beer at the premiere, you know, and like not even really liking it. <laughs> it yeah. tastes terrible. And I remember wine coolers, you know, that oh, was like, yeah. yeah, that was like in in the late 80s, you know. Mm. Um, but yeah, it, I was never much really a drinker or, or liked alcohol until, you know, um, probably late eighties, early nineties, um, I started going to clubs and then started bring drinking like, you know, at clubs, you know, um, I tried pot a couple times during the eighties and, and, um, I, re I remember, um, smoking pot with uh, Christian at his house and just going like, Oh my goodness. Like, I can't, how does this guy function? Like he, <laughs> he smokes, he smokes a joint, like, like, like people smoke cigarettes. Yeah. And I couldn't understand it. Like, I was like, wow, this, this is, he's like immune to it. And it, so it wasn't something I didn't like the way it made me feel when I was skating or like, I tried it once and I'm like, no, I don't like the way that feels. And then I tried drinking at uh, Montague Banks. They had a, remember the, the, the street spot at Montague? Yeah. 
uh, with the bank with the curb. I remember yeah. we had a huge party there and everybody was drinking and smoking. I'm like, I'm going to drink and get, you know, a little buzz. And, and I couldn't, I couldn't function. Like I was like, I'm not skating drunk, you know, or I'm not skating buzz. Cause this doesn't make it. So I never made that part of like my routine or, or something. It just didn't interest me. Um, mm. back where I was too busy, like just wanting to be a good skateboarder and not having any distractions, you know, and mm-hmm. felt like, a lot of that stuff could be a distraction, but also um, I just knew like a lot of that stuff could lead to different other drugs and stuff. So I just didn't go there. You know, I think I got look pretty wise as a kid knowing like, you know, don't try to like experiment or try all these things that your friends are doing because there was always a fear of like, what if I like that stuff, you know, cause right. there were guys, speed there were guys that were doing mushrooms there was guys that doing coke at parties uh you know a lot of guys smoking pot drinking guys were doing acid you know i just felt like you know what i don't want to ever want to try that stuff because you know i'd see movies of people like all strung out and 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 addicted and i felt like i could be like the statistic you know and so i just never went there so i think that healthy fear of like not wanting to be in a place where this, this substance gonna, is going to control me and I'm going to be addicted to it. I think that, that helped me not even want to indulge in that stuff. You just influenced somebody. I got to talk to you about these bank spots because that was huge <laughs> for us. Fish banks versus Memorex. Mm. Those were fucking like, because growing up in the peninsula, we would take the bus down. Once we saw them, figured out how to get to them. Um, which one did you prefer out of the two? Fish banks was challenging. Fish banks was really challenging. It wasn't made for skating. And Memorex Bank, that was like a launch ramp, you know, like a yeah. tip launch ramp. The one I liked was the Wave. I don't know if you ever made it to the Wave. Oh yeah, the Wave. What is it <laughs> called? Dell's Wall. Also, Dell's Wall. The yeah. Wave. Sunnyvale. Yeah. That huge bank. Yeah, with yeah. that little so, wall. Yeah. So those those spots, the bricks. We're amazing. Obfuscated the bricks. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we found a lot of those those spots because when when Winchester closed in 1980, we resorted back to the streets, and so that's where a lot you know street skating started happening more, and 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 searching for ditches. I built a ramp in my backyard um, with the help of Gavin and Corey and a lot of the the Winchester local locals. Uh, we look for backyard pools. So it went from park skating back into the backyards with a ramp and any pools that we can find, any banks that we could find um, to the point where like, this is the demise of Skateboarder Magazine, Action Now, where there was, then there was no magazine really around. So we started making our own skate zines to, to like, once again, oh, the magazine's gone. You know, so let's make our own magazine, you know. And so I got to with Gavin Corey and we created Skate Punk um, because at that time um, we were going to punk shows and like, like oh, we got to We got to think of a, a cool name for a, a magazine. Let's call it Skate Punk. We'll we'll do record reviews in there and we'll do show reviews and we'll do skate park reviews and we'll make this little zine. And then just, you know, I think it was mine was like 20, like 25 cents we would charge because of the. Of how, of how much it costs a Xerox to print them? Yeah, I remember Thrasher buying an ad in one of. I have a Thrasher ad in in no one. Of way. These, yeah, Mofo and uh, KT bought uh, a Thrasher ad in the back. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. You still have it? I still have it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever see anybody skate uh, fish banks that did something that you just couldn't believe? Like. I don't know, Doug Smith or somebody that like had some weird line or anybody that did something. Um, not necessarily. Um, yeah. but we would also, you know, we'd go there every once in a while and try to figure out different lines and stuff. Um, did you have a cover there? I did for, for trans world. Yeah. Cause I took, I took, um, Grant Britton there. Um, when, when we did, when they did an interview with me, uh, I had a spotlight in, in trans world. Um, I'm doing like a front side kick turn, I, I believe, on, on one of the little like uh, pillars there. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it might have been in some videos too, like in a, in a video. Huh. Later on. Okay. Either that or we or we shot Super 8 of us in No, I think it was in a video cuz we had videos back then. Yeah, Fishbanks was was not easy to skate. It was yeah, really, really creative. Fuck yeah. Not many people did that line that I did where you go up to the bank and then roll up and do a kitchen on on that peninsula on like little yeah, so, because you had to go through something just to get to that. And that yeah. was not easy. Yeah, it was yeah. like a whole challenging thing. Yeah. What about the vert ramps? We had like Joe Lopes, Les's, Page Mill, Valparaisa. Uh, I don't know if Heaven Ramp was around them, but uh, you had a ramp in your backyard. What What was what? Um, oh, Hunter's Point? What was... Uh, there was one in Saratoga, Mush Ramp. Mush Ramp. Yeah, yeah. What was the one that you liked the most which one was built the best like was page mill one of the best or page will page mill was one of the widest one with a channel mm -hmm. that was built really well but what year was the what, what year were those what probably would be 84 80, 80 45 right yeah i think i mean that valparaiso one in menlo park i remember there was a contest there i i forget what year but i think 87 maybe 86 oh okay well, I remember um, after that, the warehouse in San Kennedy. San Jose popped out around 1987, I say. Yeah. 97, 88. And so that's where we, we would session downtown because they had a mini ramp with the spine and yep. then they had um, the big half pipe. We yeah. got to get into there a few times. And then when they moved it to the bigger one, we were there all the time. Yeah. Yeah, those were sick. Like you, you skated with Phil a bunch, right? Phil Shaw. Phil Shaw, yeah, yeah. I skated. Uh, remember the one of the very first um, skate parks it was Menlo Menlo Park. Uh huh. Or, or no, Sport. Palo Alto. Palo Alto. Yeah, Greer. yeah, Palo yeah. Alto skate park. Yeah, yeah. I used to skate there with him. There. Mm. What about Boomerang? Boomer ramp was raging waters. Was raging waters ramp. Wow, nineteen eighty six, right? Yeah, Is that, that was, where you and Christian got the doubles, the high air, right? Yeah, we did highest. Well, he and Christian was hurt while I did the high air there. Oh, okay. Eighty seven. Um, let's see. Yeah, the boomer ramp was probably around maybe maybe two summers, and that's it. Short yeah. lived. I, mean, I want to say eighty six and eighty seven. Skate we're, we're, for a couple hours and then hit the water slides. Yeah, no, that was Insane. that was a great time in 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 the skate, San Jose skate scene. You know that ramp was the biggest ramp ever built. I think it was one hundred seven was the length. Whoa! Oh, yeah, sick. Yeah, that was that was amazing. Built very well, and they basically built it as an attraction for the long lines that were that the water slides. You know they're. They want yeah, to build so they can watch while they're waiting to slide. Yeah. And so we got hired there as um, employees to skate and they would give us uh, tickets to eat, you know, so we could skate there for free. And then also we could go on the water slides and then we could also get free meals, um, mm. you know, every day. Yeah, that's a good time. <laughs> yeah. How, how often were you coming up to SF? Like, did you skate in Barcadero at all? Come up and skate in the streets with Tommy or? I did, but not so much. Like I wasn't really a local up in uh, up in San Francisco. So sometimes I would come up and skate, like Hunter's Point, you know, skate the China Banks. She was tight when street skating was was uh, super popular in the uh, um, '90s. I did skate in Barcadero a few times. I uh, went to Hubba Hideout, skate Hunter's Point ramp. Did it's you get some at Hubba Street Cab? Yeah, I think I did a no slide on on that. Yeah. Um, that thing was high. Yeah. That was no joke. Yeah. You know what? The funny thing, this is my recollect recollection of, of San Francisco is I never wanted to go, even though it was an hour away, I never, ever wanted to go up to the city because I hated the fact that you couldn't park anywhere. You couldn't. Uh -huh. park. So that you always bummed me out. Like, you know, I don't want to drive up there because parking is going to be crazy. You can take the train. Yeah. I never really thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. Was it hard to get Tommy to come and skate SJ? Um, not really. I knew Tommy actually. It's funny is I actually knew Tommy way before. Like I knew Tommy and Tony a long time ago, like when he was on a lot of flex. Wow. That's hilarious. What year was that? 
I think I met Tommy at a, at a contest. I think there was a contest in Burlingame or somewhere that where they had this huge like wall where people were trying to get like the highest kick turn on it. I mm-hmm. maybe remembers what it is, but that was back in 1979, 78, 79. Oh. Yeah. So I've known Tommy since then. And then when I was skate Winchester, Tommy and Tony would come to Winchester and, and uh, skate with me there. And I remember Tony was more like a freestyler. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Tommy was skating transition, though. He would do like slaw bears and stuff, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, he was the tranny guy, you know? Yeah, so sick. But he did he come down to San Jose and skate street at all, like in the 90s? No. Not really, huh? Mm-mm. You don't see photos of him like down at any of those spots. Talk about uh, starting the faction. How does uh, How do you guys come up with the name? Is it like... How, was that 80? What year was that? 82, 83 or something? 1982. 82. How the faction formed was after like Winchester closing and becoming friends with Gavin and Corey and, and, and skating all these local um, spots in San Jose, looking for spots, building rent in my backyard. We also started going to shows. <clears throat> so we drive up to San Francisco and go to um, Mabuhe Garden. Gardens. On Broadway, the Tool and Die, um, and then there were shows um, locally in San Jose at Briner Hall and Campbell. Do you remember your first punk show? Yeah, it was Briner Hall. Who played? I, well, I went to go see Black Flag, but they never showed up. No way. Yeah, and then it, later I heard this um, spoken word thing with Henry Rollins say that their their bus had broke or their van broke down on their way to San Jose to play this show. And I'm like, dude, that's the show that I went to. I wore, I, I wore a black flag shirt, you know, like the black flag um, logo. Yeah. The bars, I, not the bars. It was like, it was like, remember black flag that the spray for bugs. Oh yeah. 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 So, and that was a t-shirt I had that said black flag on it. And I remember wearing it and I remember Corey making fun of me like, Oh, you're wearing a black flag t-shirt. Like, because black flags playing. So like, yeah, posh. You can never not? wear the band shirt to the <laughs> concert, bro. Yeah. To guess, guess what my first punk show was? What? It was a band you might know of that played with ill repute at the new varsity in Palo Alto. They were called, they were, I think it was you, Aggression, and Ill Repute. Yeah, it was our record release party. Dude, that's Nin- my first show at the varsity. Wow, 1985, right? It was, I can't remember. It was either 84, 85. I was in high school for sure. Okay. And it was, uh, my friends had gone the week before, like, dude, punk rock, there's, you gotta go. And then, <laughs> like, skateboarding and punk rock, it was like a no brainer, like, okay. And yeah. that was the one. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So we would go to punk shows and, and St. was one of those things, like, you know, like, I want to, I want to learn how to play bass. You know, I want to learn, I want to learn how to play, you know, play punk rock, play music, you know? So I picked up a bass and started playing with um, some friends, um, practice at their house. And then um, I built a little band room at at my, at my, my parents' house um, and we'd skate and then we practice in the band room. And then I uh, eventually asked Gavin, um, to sing for the band because what happened was we didn't have a singer, you know? So, you know, Gavin's all, I'll, 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 you know, I'll sing, I'll write some lyrics and I'll sing. Um, so then we started playing. Um, but what really got me into wanting to play, play in a band too, was uh, finding this um, 45 with the skateboarder um, skateboarding on the ramp with this, with this band sitting on, on, on the ramp. And I'm like, look at the look at this 45, and it says JFA on it. I'm like, what is JFA? And I look at the back, so oh, Jody Foster's Army. I'm like, that's a weird name for a band, but you know, it's got a skateboarder on it. it must must be cool. So mm-hmm. I got, you know, like the music, and then so JFA is is another reason why um, I wanted to start my own, you know, band. You know, so we started playing, uh, practicing, playing, and then. Um, there was this comp- compilation um, coming out 
with a bunch of local punk San Jose bands. And we had music that we had recorded in, our, in, 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 in the bedroom, but we didn't have a name. And um, the name of the production putting out the tape was called Faction Productions. And then so we were looking for a name, for a name and then all of a sudden, um, the guys that were putting on the uh, compilation said, hey, why don't you just take this name and you guys can call yourself The Faction. And then so in 1982, we, we got on this compilation called Growing Pains is the very first music that we had ever put out and put on something. Um, yeah, so wow. if you ever find a, a, a little cassette tape that's called Growing Pains with all this uh, local San Jose bands, that's the first time we were known as The Faction. Okay. And was AUK the first song you guys made or it just happened to be the song that went on the skate rock tape? It was just one of the songs that we had uh, recorded for an album that we didn't put on that, that was that made it on skate rock or, or okay. yeah, Rasher skate, skate rock tape. Do you credit? Is there is there a certain song you remember being your first song or you can't remember? Well, our first album or our first 45 that came out, there were songs like Skate Harassment, Room 101, Yesterday is Gone. It might have been called maybe Skate Harassment was one of the first. Oh, first one. <laughs> and then GSD drew the graphic for your album, right? The Dark Room. No, he drew GSD drew the the cover of our first 45 that we put out. Oh, the first 45. Yeah. Okay. yeah. The first album that we put out, uh, Mofo drew painted the cover of that. Oh, Mo did that. Yeah. The monster guy. That's just kind of like, there's nothing. It says no hidden messages. Yeah. And then there's not even like the word, the faction on the cover. It's on the back. <laughs> it was weird. weird. I don't know why, what we were thinking. Huh? Was uh, Los Solvidados and drunk engines. They were inspiration though. Of course, yeah, because I remember uh, Los Ovadados, Drunk Kings wasn't around really yet. Los Ovadados was um, one of the first local San Jose punk bands, and I was friends with Ray Stevens, um, the bass player. And my earliest recollection, you know, memory of Ray was him coming over to my house to help tune my bass, because I didn't know how to tune a, tune a guitar or a bass or anything. And uh -huh. so I had to wait for for Ray to come over <clears throat> to my base so I could play. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. Did, did Gavin write all the lyrics or did? Yeah, Gavin was the, uh, the lyricist and he wrote all the lyrics for all the, the, the music that we that we did. We got to we got to ask him who he was singing about on. She's got a tongue like a battery battery ram. Oh, I know who it is. <laughs> you do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And she's proud of it, too. It's my ex-girlfriend, Denise. Oh, really? <laughs> you know Denise Vaughn? I don't know. I don't think so. Maybe. Her, her son is Nico. Oh. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's about her. <laughs> uh, she never was bummed out about it. She was just like, oh, you know, they, they wrote a song about me. So she was always <laughs> proud, proud that, that when we sing that, play that song, it's like, oh, that song's about me. <laughs> uh, is there one show that sticks out in, in the history of the faction? Like... You opened up for some insane band or it was just a kick-ass show or something? The one that stands out the most is our very first show at San Jose State University opening up for Social Distortion. Oh, damn. Yeah. And I remember going to the bathroom and I remember I'm looking over and there's Mike Ness pissing on the stall right next to me. And I'm like, dude, I'm like in the bathroom with Mike Ness <laughs> peeing. <laughs> <laughs> And then we're going to, we're going to open up a show for them. And I remember like I was playing bass at the time and this was like 1982 and um, just staring down at my feet the whole time, not even looking at the crowd. I was so nervous. You know, I just wanted to play my bass parts. Right. And just standing still for the whole time um, yeah. to, to play our set. And what's the coolest thing about all that is, so the first show that I ever played, was you know opening up for um social distortion in 1982 and i have these shows booked next month um with social distortion with my new band your thing oh really yeah so it's gonna be kind of cool like you know i don't know how long it, was that 40 is that 40 years <sighs> 82 to now is 40 years right yeah so I'll be sharing the same stage with Mike Ness 40 years later in a new band. That's amazing. <laughs> it's crazy. I was just talking to Salba yesterday and we were talking about like kind of the age thing and like 
how he looks up to like Tony Alva. He's like, he's still going. So I got to keep going. And then he's like, Navarrete and the younger guys are looking up to me. Like I'm still going. So they're still going. It's like, yeah. we don't, you know, it's like, what, when do we stop? Like we don't until we have to. Right. Well, I just had this conversation with someone the other day. It's like, what other sport has their professional athlete had this longevity that we do? Right. There's not, there's not one sport that's that, that besides skateboarding, that's pushed the limits to, turning pro at a very young age and then continue at that level till you're in your fifties, you know? So I, I plan on in my sixties still skating and doing what I'm doing. Um, I work hard every day to just try to maintain and get over my injuries and just try to keep that mindset of like, never, ever like fall into a place like, man, I wish I, I, I didn't stop skating or, or um, so we're right now. It's like, we're creating that and we're setting, we're setting the level, um, the standard to how long you could skate for, you know, even at a professional level or at the level that we're at now, you know, it, it, I don't even think about it. Like I'm almost, you know, I'm going to be 58 in November. Like it doesn't even boggle me the fact that we're still dropping in on 14 foot half pipes and, you know, trying to blast errors and, and, and do the things that we do, you know? Mm hmm I just wonder, like, from my perspective, I don't know if the next generation is going to have the same ride that your generation did. Like, you guys are, you guys are like legends, but will there be another legends that like last as long as you're, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think, I think there's possibilities there because, like, is Tristan Rennie going to skate when he's 60? You know, like these younger kids that rip, like Corey Juno, those kind of guys, like, are they going to, be still skating and being getting paid at 60. There's so many people, whereas your, your class or whatever you want to call it, there was a more like you, Miller, Hasoy, you can name these people. The next group is like thousands, you know? So it's, I don't know. It's really going to be um, determined on the person's personality and their drive. And I think that's what, what the problem is is you got to keep that drive alive. You got to keep that passion alive. And I think the fact that me and Josoy and Lance and Tony and Miguel, we still have that passion. But then also, you know, we've built a legacy to the fact like, you know, I still get paid as a pro skateboarder, but I'm getting paid for stuff that I did in the past now. Mm. You know, like like our, our, our reissue boards, like those still sell really well. And, I would never imagine that that those boards would would still be my income today, you know, because mm. the early 90s, no one even wanted a reissue board. You couldn't even they couldn't even get rid of those things. Yeah. But now the kids that looked up to us in, in the 80s all are all grown up. They have great jobs. They want to really relive their their childhood. So they buy those boards that their parents bought them in the 80s. And now they have them. They're either skating them or collecting them, you know. So we've lasted that long to, to, to see that full circle come around where, you know, the, we're still making money on a pro board that we don't, we rode in the eighties. Yeah. But yeah. then having your own shoe that helps too, right? That definitely helped me um, for the longevity and also brand, brand my name into a lar larger audience. Cause Vans is a lifestyle brand. So they cater to like BMX snowboarding, surfing, motocross, art, music. So because I have a signature shoe with my name on it and it's coalized with Vans, my name is still in talked about because of the shoe. So that's definitely helped my career prolong. So, you know, even though I skate for fun and um, I still try to maintain practice, it, you know, um, I probably don't have to skate to still make money off these things, but I want to because i want this to last even longer mm. i have fans that are young i mean they're like sometimes six seven years old it trips me out like i'm like how do you know who i am i'm not even like the dude anymore and you you know who i am uh. so when they grow up they're gonna remember me and then you know what i mean so so and so and so you but know, it's probably from their parents like when i was skating caballero was the guy like you know or yeah. whatever yeah that's so, cool though. Yeah. And so a lot of people, sometimes they think like, oh, you know, 
this, these things are just handed to you. you. You're so lucky, you know, but man, we, we, we keep working. We've worked, we've never stopped working. You know, <laughs> you see, you hear of skaters, like I'll, I'll post something and be like, Oh man, you inspired me to get back into skating. These are skaters that were skating in the eighties. They quit or maybe skating nineties. They quit. They got jobs. They stopped skating and they lost that whole feeling of their childhood and, and what, what skating brought to them that they want to relive, relive that and bring it back to them. So this is why I love skating now is because I continue to remind people that skateboarding is fun. Um, it's exciting and you can do it at any age if your mindset and your body is healthy enough to allow you to do it. So first off, your body has to have the ability to do it. And two, you have them have the mental capacity to even want to go there because, you know, skateboarding is dangerous, man. <laughs> it's not, it's not easy. No matter what. The, yeah. yeah. You get broke off. Really. Yeah. <laughs> What is a more plus trip if uh, Tony Hawk calls you and he says we're going on a trip or Van Doren calls you and says we're going on a trip? Um, I would say Van Doren. <laughs> really? Yeah, because, you know, we're going to eat good. Huh. <laughs> we're going to stay in killer hotels. And he just, he, you know, he's just a great guy to be around. Always promoting the sport. Always like just is stoked, you know. Um, Steve's awesome. Yeah, he's an he's an amazing ambassador of the sport, and he's just a good asset to Vans. And I'm just so happy to, you know, have that relationship and that friendship and, um, with Vans with him. Um, but you know, not to say that, not to knock down any trips that I've gone with Tony and, and you know it's the great skate park tour that we did back in the early 2000s. Boom um, boom hug jam. Yeah, boom boom hug jam. <laughs> that stuff was pretty fun. Um, so, I mean, those are great times too, you know? Yeah. Huh. It's all, it's all different. It's all rel relevant. Like, but, um, you know, the Vans Warp Tour was one of the most amazing, you know, tours that I had done, you know, mixing punk rock with skateboarding and traveling the world, going to Australia, going overseas to Europe and traveling all of US. I mean, I made a lot of fans. You know, I remember uh, going on that tour for five weeks straight and vans making posters and i would sign 250 posters i'd sign 500 posters a day 250 after each demo um each and so i gave away a, they gave away a lot of posters i signed a lot i met a lot of people on the vans warp tour every year uh -huh. you know so just doing that and making these relationships with fans and stuff has built my fan base you know you got a P stone story for me. Yeah. So that board slide that I did at Burnell, uh -huh. uh, that he filmed that. <laughs> Schmitty, yeah. you, th you think I didn't film that? I was there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, fi he filmed that. I remember him coming up and, and, and hearing that I'm going to uh, go do this rail. That was, um, it was 22 steps long, but the steps were, twice as long as a normal step. So I equip, equated to like 44 steps. Mm -hmm. But that was one of the um, times first meeting him and, and, and shooting video with him. Cause I know he used to come out and shoot a lot of pal stuff. Yeah. He lived you know? with Andy, right. For a little bit. Andy McDonald. Oh, he did. I, I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Him and Rhino lived there. When I first met him, uh, Andy had the uh, fireman's pole from his room down there. Oh, that's right. <laughs> and, right. And Peace Donor Rhino rented a room there. Yeah. But, yeah. We, you know, we've gone on some tours and, and gone on some um, pal, pal things together. And, and I remember he was the filmer um, for the tr those trips and stuff. But, yeah, I mean, great dude. Always, always happy, always smiling and just always ready to film. Never complaining. Mm -hmm. Um just a, just a great dude, just a, a great dude that just loved the sport and he just loved being around skateboarding and helped promote, promote it, you know? So bummer he's gone so quick, you know, and, and, but unfortunately, you know, we all make choices and sometimes we make bad choices and he made a bad choice, mm. you know? Yeah. <laughs> That's why you don't drink and drive and yeah. you don't get in a car with someone who's drinking and driving. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It's super important. Yeah.
Yeah, I I mean, Phil died the same way. It sucks. Yeah. I've lost a few people in drunk driving accidents, and two of them happened to be like kind of my best friends. Right. They're the passengers (laughs) in the car. Yeah, exactly. And the driver lived on both of them. Whoa, really? Yeah. So So you got to think about the drivers and how they feel, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. They're stuck with that for the rest of their life. Yeah. You and that must, I mean? be, that must be painful as well. So, you know, those drivers, they made bad choices. And, and but then again, you know, the passengers could have said, you know, no, I'm not not coming. It's, it's just part of that making bad choices. And, and we've all done it. We've all made bad choices. And I, you know, and I, I'm not <clears throat> going to say that I'm not guilty of that because I've been in situations where. OK, so here's here's a here's a thing that I'll never forget. I went to Tony Hawk's Skater of the Year party in San Francisco. Oh, yeah. Pierre kissed him. Yeah. <laughs> I got drunk that night. Uh. I got really drunk that night. I guess you drove home. Oh, shit. So I drove my girlfriend. All the way to San Jose? Yep. Drove Ooh. my girlfriend and her roommate, his, her roommate passed out in the back, and I'm driving home from San Francisco, buzzed, drunk, and I'm going like, if I get pulled over right now, I'm going to get a DUI. Mm. So even myself, I've made a stupid choice like that. And I could have ended my life. I could have ended their life, you know? So, you know, it's just one of those things where, you know, everyone makes a bad choice and some live to tell the tale of it and some don't, you know? So I'm not going to say that I'm better than, than the person, the people that, that unfortunately ended Phil, you know, and P stones, um, life. I'm just as guilty as that. Those people. Yeah, it sucks. Uh, one of the guys from Instagram, I put up a little thing. I was interviewing you. And one of the guys wanted to know if you remember seeing the Beastie Boys at the end of the college. He said may, maybe they played with Fishbone or Murphy's Law or something at the end of the college way back in the 80s. I don't remember. <laughs> no. Okay. I don't know if uh, I would that show. And then the other one was uh, Mike, Sorry. Pris- Mike Prisenko or Chris Miller. Chris Miller. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Prisenko wanted to be Miller, right? <laughs> he did. Um, yeah. And then I guess in closing, kind of um, been asking, especially some of the older guys, like, how do we age gracefully? Like what's, what's, what have you learned in your process getting here? You spoke about longevity and like, continuing to skate and everything like Salvo was saying, stretching is super important. And uh, I'm, I'm guessing eating healthy and like, you know, all that stuff. But as far as mindset is more kind of what I'm thinking ment- mentality wise, like what kind of things do you kind of like keep your confidence and keep your like perseverance going and the stoke, you know, like doing it for this long and not getting jaded or like whatever, like, I need to like, I want to learn a new trick today vibe or something like that. Um, I guess it's different for everybody. For myself, I love skating with people. I love that push. I love the commodity of friendships. It's really, really difficult for me to skate by myself at this age. I just can't get myself to do it. When I was younger, yeah, no problem. Cause I really, really loved skateboarding and all I cared about was progression. But now at the age that I'm at, sometimes you need a little bit of a push and having a good session with good friends helps with that. And just being always just being very open minded of like just skating everything, you know, and not being afraid to be vulnerable, to be in a situation that you're not comfortable with. And always just think positive, surround yourself with positive people that, that are, that have a lot of energy. And um, so in my whole career like my friendships have come and gone you know some people have, were really stuck on skateboarding and then they don't want to skateboard anymore so they have to find a, a new group of friends so always try to f- surround yourself with those group of friends that that get you stoked and get you hyped so i got a gold medal in drinking and air guitar i, I think that's the best thing and sometimes you're going to have to leave these old friends that don't want to skate anymore and and discover new people you know and you had kind of have to move on to the, to the next group of people that are going to get you motivated to get out there. And I just made a post just to, um, on Instagram uh, just yesterday about just keeping a positive mindset 
don't talk bad about yourself. PMA is everything. Like believe in yourself, believe that you can do things. Don't, don't ever like get in a situation that you, that you're not good enough, you know, or that you're not capable enough. Like always have this enthusiastic um, vision of like, man, I, I believe I could do that someday. Right. I do that. So no, I, I never have the like, Oh, I'll never, I'll never land that trick or I'll never get to go. I'll never get to travel to this place or, I'll ne- you know, if when you speak those words into your life, they actually become reality. So you mm-hmm. want to speak, you want to speak positive things in your life. You want to speak positive things about yourself. That's what gets you motivated to wake up and, and, and attack the world and, and challenge yourself, you know, and, and, and just always look for that next challenge because that's what brings excitement and growth to your life. Always look for that next challenge. Right. Like if you're bored, then, then look at something like that, that you've never done or like, and say like, man, I, w- I would love to be good at that. Um, let me try it, you know? And, and just, but just know that it's going to take a long time to get to that level where you are going to be good at it. And it takes a lot of, a lot of uh, time and effort and hard work. And once you put on, put in those hours into something you will eventually progress and get good at it. It just, you know, you just have to have patience. And my interpretation of patience is long suffering. Mm. If you're not willing to suffer, you're not going to have any patience at all. <laughs> so get ready to suffer. You just influence somebody. Is part of what you were talking about in the beginning there, um, kind of what drew you to move away from Northern California? to be around more people skating and have more opportunity. There's so much more spots to skate down there. Obviously there's tons of parks and ramps and everything. I felt like um, San Jose, NorCal has ups, has its ups and downs of like the stoke about skateboarding and then the people that you skate with and the sessions. And I felt like at the time that I left San Jose, <clears throat> it was very stagnant, you know, oh. always looking for a session, no one motivating me to go skate. You know, and I just kind of felt like it's really, really, really not a good scene up here. You know, Mm -hmm. I felt like if I made a change and lived down here, I could I could be in a place that it's there's hype, you know. And I think that really builds communities and and, and helps helps the scene grow. But when there's nothing happening, no one like motivating and and getting together, then it, it the scene dies. Okay. Is it what's the one thing you miss about up here? Oh shoot! What do I miss about NorCal? Um, my friends. Yeah, my friends. My my the relationships I built my whole life for forty nine years. That's like my favorite part of life. We'll end it with what does skate and destroy mean to you? Skate and destroy, I would say, means to skate a certain place and just destroy it, just anni- annihilate it, like just do what you can and then you can't think of anything else that you can do there you know just smash it (laughs) um we always end with a song do you got a song suggestion you'd like to play to take us out of here um i don't know what what music do you have and anything you can play anything it could be like one of your favorite songs it could be one of the songs (laughs) you play yeah you want to do one off of your does your thing have a, a, a recordings? Yeah, we have uh, we on iTunes and Spotify. Yeah, I can do any of those. Yeah, you can you can play a song um, called Avalanches, which features the singer for H two O. His name is Toby. Huh. And so that's one of our one of my favorite songs um, in the band. It's called Avalanches by Urethane. And then, are you guys still touring? You're you're gonna get back on the road. Yeah, I leave on tour um, in seven days. We're going to Europe for two weeks. So anybody out in Europe listening, take a look for Eurothane. We'll be coming your way. Will you be doing a U.S. tour when you come back? Um, when we come back, we'll, we'll be home for about a week, and then we're going to go up north. Oh, nice. Yeah, so we're going to be going up to Washington, Seattle, and then we're going to make it our way down to San, Diego, uh, San Jose, um, Santa Cruz, Menlo Park, uh, Fresno. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, come check it. Nice. Yeah. Well, good, dude. Thanks so much for taking the time. I really appreciate this. Thank you for letting me share my stories. <laughs> appreciate you, Steve. And uh, take care of yourself. Hopefully I'll see you in the real life and not on the monitor in the future. 
no worries, man. This is this is uh, it's good touching base again. Hell yeah! Take Appreciate care of yourself. Okay. Thanks for support. Yep. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you for listening to another episode of Talking Schmidt. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Anchor, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. When you subscribe, you'll get notifications every Tuesday of new episodes the minute they become available. Also, please leave reviews and a five-star rating. It's the best way to help the show grow. All of the episodes will always remain free, but if you would like to help support the show, you can do so at TalkingSchmidt.com, where you can pick up some merchandise like t-shirts, beanies, hats, and stickers. The website has an entire archive of all of the episodes with extra photos and videos. Email us with any suggestions, comments, or ways that the show may have improved your life at talkingschmidt at gmail.com. All interviews are conducted, edited, and produced by Schmitty. The intro music is Mary's Cross by the band Nature. A very special shout-out goes to the executive director, Cheryl Camisa. Shout-out. Love it! This is Talking Schmidt, where the Rolodex is deep, but the conversation is deeper. Keep the wheels greased.